A new space race is underway. The destination is still the moon, but this time, the United States may not be in the lead. Instead, China appears to be making steady, confident strides toward its lunar ambitions. So how fast is China advancing? What's driving their progress? And what could it mean if they get there first? Let's find out. Just last week, at the Wincheng spacecraft launch site, China successfully conducted the second static fire test of its Long March 10 carrier rocket, the country's next-generation launch vehicle designed for future crewed lunar missions. This marks a major milestone in China's roadmap to land astronauts on the moon. At 3 p.m., following the ignition command from the test control center, all seven engines of the rocket's first stage ignited simultaneously. The test lasted for 320 seconds and followed multiple procedures as planned. According to the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation and the China Manned Space Engineering Office, the tethered hot fire focused on verifying engine performance under low thrust conditions and testing secondary restart capabilities. This test comes just under a month after the first tethered hot fire conducted at the same site on August 15th. Together, the two tests have fully validated the performance of the first stage's seven-engine propulsion system and confirmed the reliability of the recovery phase program design. The Long March 10 is being developed by the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, a subsidiary of CASC. It is intended to support China's manned lunar exploration program and will be capable of launching both crewed spacecraft and lunar landers. The Long March 10 series includes two main configurations. The standard Long March 10 is a three-stage rocket with two boosters. It has a diameter of 5 meters and a maximum height of 92.5 meters, and it will handle launch missions for both manned spacecraft and lunar landers. The Long March 10A is a two-stage, partially reusable version of the rocket. It also has a 5-meter diameter, but is shorter, standing at 67 meters tall. Its first stage is designed for recovery and reuse. The 10A version will be used primarily for launching the Mengzhou crewed spacecraft and Tianzhou cargo spacecraft during the operational phase of China's space station program. Peng Zhihao, a senior space expert, praised the recent milestone achieved by China's space program, calling the successful engine test a significant leap forward in the development of the Long March 10 rocket. The test, which validated more than 50 critical technologies, marks a major breakthrough in the advancement of China's manned lunar landing capabilities. This large-scale ground test was pivotal, Peng noted. It successfully demonstrated multi-engine parallel operation, power system coordination, and the adaptability of launch site infrastructure, key components for a future crewed lunar mission. From a broader timeline perspective, Peng emphasized that the successful static fire test has accelerated China's manned lunar exploration program, which aims to land astronauts on the moon by 2030. This test moves the Long March 10 rocket into the sprint phase of development, he said. It provides crucial technical validation and boosts confidence in meeting the 2030 deadline. According to Peng, China's manned lunar program is advancing smoothly. Since mid-June, multiple systems have undergone intensive parallel testing, including the Mengzhou crewed spacecraft, the Lanyue lunar lander, and the Long March 10 launch vehicle. Construction of supporting infrastructure at the Wenchang Space Launch Site is also progressing steadily. Looking ahead, future tests may involve a full first-stage launch of Long March 10, with potential flight and landing trials. In a related effort, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation is preparing for an orbital launch and recovery test using the Long March 12A. CASC also plans a comprehensive hot-fire test involving all 21 engines on the Long March 10's first stage. So yeah, the Chinese are definitely not trying to keep it a secret about their ambitions in space, especially when it comes to landing humans on the moon. There's a new 112-page report titled Redshift, published by the Commercial Space Federation, an advocacy group promoting U.S. commercial space investment, that outlines in detail how China's space capabilities have expanded rapidly over the past decade and how that growth is accelerating. The report provides the most up-to-date overview of China's space infrastructure, including its Tiangong space station, expanding satellite megaconstellations, and upcoming lunar and planetary missions. 
One of the most concerning takeaways for the United States, China may become the first nation to return humans to the moon since the Apollo missions ended in 1972. China is not only racing to catch up, it is setting the pace, deregulating, and, at times, redefining what leadership looks like on and above Earth, the report states. China's space ascendancy, propelled by disciplined policy, strategic investment, and sweeping technological gains, has fundamentally redrawn the domain in which global power is contested. In 2021, China and Russia announced joint plans to build the International Lunar Research Station a moon-based research outpost open to international collaboration, including, theoretically, even the U.S., despite ongoing political tensions. Since that announcement, China has continued to hit major milestones on its path to landing astronauts on the moon by 2030. These milestones include ultra-high-resolution mapping of the lunar surface, returning lunar soil samples to Earth, and building next-generation heavy-lift rockets. The 2028 Chang'e 8 mission will feature scientific payloads or involvement from nine countries, reflecting China's increasing global cooperation in space science. Looking further ahead, China plans to establish a fully operational lunar base by 2035, powered by an autonomous nuclear reactor. This could secure its access to valuable lunar resources and give it a significant strategic advantage in the long-term race to put humans on Mars. Meanwhile, over on the U.S. side of the table, there's the Artemis program, America's big effort to get astronauts back on the moon by 2027, as part of a longer-term goal of eventually heading to Mars. Artemis is a huge project. It supports around 70,000 jobs across all 50 states and generates over $14 billion in total economic output. So, on paper, it looks like the U.S. is aiming for 2027, while China is targeting 2030, which should mean the U.S. gets there first, right? Well, not necessarily. The Artemis program originally planned for a 2024 landing, but that date has slipped multiple times. Some earlier problems, like the Orion capsule's heat shield, seem to be mostly resolved now. But landing humans on the moon is no small task, and Artemis still faces a number of major technical and logistical hurdles that make the 2027 target far from guaranteed. That uncertainty has raised some real concerns. What if China beats the U.S. back to the moon? Sure, the U.S. has already been there, but experts say the stakes are different this time. There's growing worry that whichever country lands first might try to claim access to the moon's most valuable real estate, especially areas rich in water ice or other resources that could support future missions, or even permanent settlements. But how has China managed to make such steady progress? Are they using some kind of secret technique? Well, the secret, if you can call it that, isn't really a secret at all. It's increased funding. According to a Redshift report, while it's tough to pin down the exact numbers on China's space spending, signs of a major shift go back as far as 2015. That's when China began involving private companies in its lunar program, an important move to break the dominance of state-owned enterprises and speed up technological development. Between 2015 and 2024, China clearly ramped up its lunar and deep space efforts, which would have required much larger budgets and stronger government backing. Experts believe this trend is only going to continue, especially with rising investment across both civil and military space programs. One report from Euroconsult estimated that China's total government space spending reached nearly $20 billion in 2024, with consistent growth each year since at least 2020. During that same period, government-backed investments in private space companies also shot up, jumping from 48% of all space investment in 2020 to a whopping 79% in 2024. We're now seeing real signs of public-private collaboration taking shape. Companies like Star Vision Aerospace Group Limited is working on things like satellite design, advanced AI for data analysis, and next-gen satellite systems all of which are expected to play a role in future missions like Chang'e 8. That shows China is serious about giving the private sector a place in its long-term space plans. In fact, China invested $2.86 billion into commercial space ventures just last year, over 17 times the $164 million it spent in 2016. With that kind of funding, progress becomes a lot more straightforward. Just look at NASA. Around 50 years ago, it got nearly 5% of the U.S. national budget to put people on the moon, and it worked. So it's no surprise that China's generous funding is making its space journey look a lot smoother, too. Another big factor in China's space progress is its openness to working with other countries, including Russia, India, and Japan. 
This collaborative strategy, often referred to as the Space Silk Road, has already led to over 80 joint projects with international partners. According to the researchers, this growing network is starting to erode U.S. influence in the global space scene. There are even some opinions suggesting that China's centralized planning system, along with its more flexible stance on safety and environmental regulations, could actually allow it to move faster than the U.S., even though America had a big head start in the space race. So, what happens if China lands humans on the moon before the U.S.? That's a question many are asking, including Mike Gold, president of Civil and International Space at Redwire and one of the key architects behind the Artemis Accords. Let me put it this way. China lands on the moon, and the very next day, they reap huge political benefits, Gold said during a recent hearing. Suddenly, the world's eyes turn to them, not just for space exploration, but for national security partnerships and trade agreements too. This was the same hearing that former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine warning, unless something changes, it is highly unlikely the United States will beat China's projected timeline. Gold pointed to China's growing cooperation with countries like India and Russia, suggesting that an early moon landing would only strengthen those economic and geopolitical ties. China is very good at using space as a tool to shape global dynamics, he said. If they get there first, we could see a major global realignment, one that affects our economy, our tax base, our capacity to innovate, and even our national security. To be fair, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty makes it clear that no nation can claim the moon or any part of outer space as its sovereign territory. Ownership is explicitly off-limits. No one can take control by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. However, what the treaty doesn't prohibit is being the first to operate in critical areas, and that makes a big difference. The reality is that whoever gets there first gains a powerful edge. Early actors on the lunar surface will shape how things are done. They'll influence the norms, set the tone for operations, and build the infrastructure that future missions will have to work around. So even though legal ownership isn't an option, de facto control can emerge through practice. That's where the real competition lies. If China successfully lands a crew on the moon before the U.S. returns, it could shift the dynamics in several important ways. First, it would boost the credibility of China's International Lunar Research Station, potentially attracting new partners and strengthening its narrative as a global space leader. Second, Chinese-built infrastructure, like the Kuechao 2 relay satellite, might become the default system for lunar operations within the ILRS, which could make future coordination with other nations more complicated. And third, simply occupying key locations, like the few sunlit ridges near lunar ice deposits, could create congestion, forcing later arrivals to navigate around pre-established presences and increasing the need for coordination. None of this would amount to legal sovereignty, of course. The Outer Space Treaty would still apply, but the real advantage lies in setting the standards, shaping the routines, and writing the early chapters of how humanity operates on the moon.